Good morning, family. I hope everyone is well. We're grateful to God that so far in Salmon, we don't have any confirmed cases of the virus. I'm particularly grateful that those who would be susceptible to it in our congregation have also been spared. We pray that God continues to keep you healthy and strengthen you through these uncertain days. This morning, I want to share with you first a devotional for the Lord's Supper. And then I'll bring you a lesson. A lesson about being, our being content and convinced of God's purpose in our lives. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, I want to share with you a lesson about making a limitless sacrifice. A lesson which is drawn both from Genesis chapter 22 and Romans chapter 28. The Old Testament passage that speaks directly to the heart of the gospel is Genesis 22. There you'll recall that God is testing Abraham's obedience, saying in Genesis 22 and verse 2, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go into the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering. We understand that burnt offerings were required to remove the curse of death for the sins committed. Now the test was whether Abraham would obey God and do so no matter what. Would he obey even though it seemed to violate all that he thought he knew about God's nature and about the worship that God would be pleased with? Would he obey God even though it seemed to frustrate his promises to bless Abraham through his son? Even though it required him to kill the only son whom he loved? Certainly Abraham passed the test. And the test itself was enough to prove obedience without the deed. At the last instant, God intervened and said in Genesis 22 and verse 12, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. The time came nearly 2,000 years later, and now almost 2,000 years ago, for another father to offer up his only son, whom he indeed loved. It would happen on a hill not far from the hill where Abraham would have sacrificed Isaac. This dearly loved son repeatedly asked his father if it were again possible not to go through with the sacrifice. This time it was not possible. There would be no last minute intervention. No other lamb would suffice. You see, God required of himself a degree of sacrifice greater than he demanded from Abraham, greater than he's demanded even from us. In Romans 8 and verse 32, Paul asks us to see this sacrifice, God's sacrifice, as proof of his abiding love in every circumstance of our life. It's a great assurance we rely upon even today in the circumstances we face at this time. The awareness of God's abiding love. For he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Family, God has put his own love to the supreme test. And he passed the test with a limitless sacrifice. God has indeed graciously given to us all things, most especially given to us the salvation that we need most of all. We are keenly aware then of God's abiding love and our abiding in hope for the resurrection from the dead. Indeed, God made a limitless sacrifice. His son suffered so that we might be glorified with him. Let us give thanks for the bread. 
Heavenly Father, we are awed and humbled by your marvelous plan to give your Son, the one who is the manifestation of your very nature, your love, your mercy, your grace, to save sinners. We are grateful, Father, that Jesus was willing to give himself on the cross. May we ever be mindful of our need for that sacrifice. May we never forget Jesus gave his life so that we might have life. Father, we thank you for the bread that we partake now in memory of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us also now give thanks for the cup. That emblem, the fruit of the vine, which to us is Christ shed blood. A memorial to that blood which established the covenant, made possible our salvation. The blood which washes away our sins and by our continuing faithfulness and obedience, we are continually sprinkled clean. And by that covenant kept for an eternal salvation. Oh, how greatly we are in need of the blood. Let us give thanks. Heavenly Father, we likewise thank you. Knowing that all things, all your promises are established by a covenant. And a covenant made effective by blood. We're grateful that we can be your children, that you have added us to your church, all the great promises. Just as Paul said, will you not give us all things? Indeed you have. And we give thanks, Father, for the gifts that you have granted to us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. If we were gathered together this morning, we would now conclude the Lord's Supper and also worship God in the other manner that he has instructed us. We would bring those gifts, those offerings that we have purposed in our heart to give. Well, it's a little bit different today. Still, we need to keep that instruction. We need to do all that God has commanded us. We are continuing to support the students at Bear Valley, continuing to support the children at Mountain States, continuing the mailing of house to house. We will, I suspect, in these coming weeks, find an increasing need for benevolence. Those we might serve in this time of lost jobs, medical needs, yet even unforeseen. We want to be prepared for that. We want to be willing to, to serve as we ought. And so we pray that each of us will remember our need to give back to the Lord. You can do so if you would like to. You could mail the checks to Jeff Miner and he'll be certain to get those deposited in the church's treasury. Let us all just so give thanks. Heavenly Father, indeed, we are blessed in this congregation. Blessed to be here where most of us have not been affected financially by this current crisis. Rather, we are being prospered. And may we continually remember all that you have provided for us, for the means that we have to to live, to live quite well. Father, we're grateful that through your covenant promises, you indeed provide all that we need and much more. And may we in all humility and gentleness and spirit and love for others, 
give our offerings for your service. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings we continually to enjoy. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In weeks to come, I hope to get a little bit handier with all this electronic stuff. I'm certainly grateful for Byron, who's a great help in this. I hope to soon be able to add some some acapella hymns to this that you might have those also to sing with. But hopefully there in your home, you remember certainly some hymns by heart. Perhaps you have a book there. And I pray that you're enjoying even this morning to offer your worship to God in song. This morning I want to bring you a lesson and it, again, it, it seems so strange bringing a lesson in this way. It's strange not to receive one another with handshakes and hugs. And yet it is good to be with you in spirit. Since we have been separated, many of you have expressed how much you're missing God's family. And for that reason, no sooner than we were separated, I began to, to think how we might come back together began to plan for a family reunion. We can imagine that day, we could look forward to that day, somewhat like a homecoming. I believe it'll be a great time for all of us to invite anyone and everyone who's ever been a member of this church or a friend of this family or even a guest at some time to invite them to join us that day for a family reunion. However, while it's good to plan for that homecoming, that overlooks what can be accomplished in the meantime. Whatever we plan for the future ought not get in the way of God's purpose in the present. During these uncertain and anxious days, I've thought mostly of, of, about Paul. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul having learned to be content in whatever circumstance he found himself Oftentimes, those circumstances were horrendous, often suffering severely, often with great concern for his loved ones in the faith. But in whatever and every circumstance, it's crucial that he said he had learned to be content. We're going to consider that learning process today. And yet beyond being content, Paul was convinced that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Those are very well-known verses to us. And yet when you add them together and you apply them to your own life, those verses are a certain cause for hope, even in these uncertain days. Namely, Paul was content because he was convinced of God's purpose. God indeed has the ways and means to accomplish good in every circumstance. And so it ought to be that through these uncertain days, we learn to trust God and to trust him all the more. In the email I sent most of you on Thursday, I ask you to give this matter some thought. Perhaps you have considered what good can be accomplished in these days, especially to consider how God is working in you and through you. How can each of us best serve God by serving one another right now? For like the Apostle Paul, being separated from his loved ones often proved to be a unique opportunity to serve others. Many of the burdens of the day were removed from him when he was oftentimes alone. Let us understand that the greatest opportunity to teach others, the best time to teach those truths, the gospel of which we are certain, is when others are uncertain. And so while the earth is quaking beneath our feet and disease is blowing in the wind, I would encourage us to do two things. 
First, let us learn to be content. And second, let us be convinced that of our place in God's purpose. To that end, we're going to gather from Paul's experience that being content results from being convinced of our purpose. To that end, we will recall that Paul was often separated from his loved ones in Christ. He earnestly longed to be reunited. We read about that in Romans chapter 1 and verse 11. There he wrote to the saints he so dearly loved, saying he's longing to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. We recall that every letter was written because Paul was separated from the saints he loved. Yes, even while he was sheltered in place, sheltered in prison, sometimes for years at a time. It turned out to be a unique opportunity for service. And it was in prison to a great degree that, that Paul learned the secret of being content. His contentment was evident to those who heard him singing praises to God and, and praying to God both day and night. His conviction was evident as he continued to teach the same gospel which landed him in prison. Sometimes we wonder perhaps how that could be. Because not only is he separated, he's also recovering from being beaten and stoned. Were it not for the saints, bringing him food, he very well might have starved to death in prison. And yet there he learned to be content by being convinced of his purpose. That really is the definition of contentment. Being content and practicing your purpose. Now, since Paul has learned the secret, I think we should be sure that we can too. Because as a man, Paul's not inherently any smarter than we are. As mere mortals, Paul was naturally disobedient, naturally discontent. We naturally want to have more, and we naturally know how to complain when we don't. And so when Paul says, I have learned the secret, it's really because he's a good student, a good student of Christ, a good student of life, of, of man's ways. Paul has learned this. The word learn is in a passive sense, meaning Paul received knowledge from the best teacher, from the word, of course, and certainly from the example of his Lord and Savior. Through Christ's example, Paul has been very well taught through Christ's perfection in living the word, Paul was convinced. So thoroughly was he convinced. It is in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5 that Paul speaks of his full conviction of faith. It is indeed his certain confidence. Since Paul had learned the secret, so can we. Throughout these uncertain days, we will come to trust all the more that our great God and His Word are certain. His covenant, His promise is certain. Family, that may well be God's purpose in these uncertain times. When thousands are dying and folks are worried about their money vanishing in the wind, when most folks don't know whose report to listen to, not knowing really what to believe, our assurance is this. It is possible. Because of the greatness of our God, it is possible to be content. So let us recall what God has done. From the beginning, God promised that in exchange for obedience, His people would be content. Oh, it's going to take them a long time to learn it. And they're going to 
fight, it seemingly complain more than they even desire to be content. But he's going to teach them. Beginning in Leviticus 26. Leviticus chapter 26, beginning in verse 6. We find the covenant promises that God has made. Let's read it together. There in beginning in Leviticus 26 and in verse 3. There God lays forth the, the conditions of the covenant. He said, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out. In other words, knowing what you ought to do, you're going to practice it. You're going to keep it. Then I shall give you the rains in their season. So the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last you until the grape gathering and the grape gathering will last until the sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. There's the promise. It's a conditional promise, yes. And in that way, he says in verse 9, I will turn, you, uh, turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will confirm my covenant with you. That's the truth of what God's doing. God says, this is my word, you do this, and I will keep my word. Moreover, he said in verse 10, you will eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. And moreover, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. You see, that's a picture of contentment, isn't it? I'll be your God and you'll be my people. You'll have all I ever promised, more than you could dream. It's a picture of contentment in exchange for their obedience. By obedience, God would teach his people and they could learn to be content. The problem is throughout history, God's people are typically very poor students and we tend to be slow learners. It's a problem from the beginning. And that's why Moses continued to teach in Deuteronomy chapter 6. There we'll begin also in verse 6. If you want to turn there, Deuteronomy 6 beginning in verse 6. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. What's he mean? This is going to be the focus of your life in all that you do and all you say. This is the focus. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. What's God saying? You do this, and I will do that, and you will be satisfied. You see, that's what Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 4, and verse 11. When he says, I have learned to be, you can pick your word, either content or satisfied. The same ba basis by covenant, I will keep what you said, Lord. I will do as you said. I will practice to live as you would have me live. And I will be content. It's no longer a secret, is it? He said, I've learned the secret of being content. It's no longer a secret. It never was intended to be kept as a secret. Because God gave the answer from the very beginning. 
It was meant to be learned from the beginning. That God, through our obedience to his instruction, is causing us to become content. I believe, family, that that is God's purpose in these uncertain days, such that we would become all the more certain of his ways. We too can learn by following Christ's example. For by who better than Christ could Paul be taught? Who better than Christ could teach Paul, according to Philippians 4 and verse 12, how to get along with humble means, about how to be filled or hungry, both of an abundance and suffering need? Paul had so well learned that he concluded that in whatever and every circumstance, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Family, that is as much to confess that apart from Christ, he is nothing. And it would be for us as well. That apart from Christ, we are nothing. We can not accomplish anything good apart from God's strengthening us. Through him we can do all things. And certainly that is what God would have us to understand. I believe this is a time when we can accomplish much good. Certainly not of ourselves alone, but by the power of God according to his good purpose. Think about Paul, separated from his loved ones, much as we are right now. But in his case, separation, sickness, hunger, even imprisonment, was for Paul all the more reason to serve God by serving others. Let's recall, it is a unique circumstance because the bulk of Paul's powerful and effectual prayers were uttered in prison. The letters written to keep the saved saved were penned in the dim light of prison. And by every prayer, every song, every letter, Paul is fully convicted of the gospel and thoroughly convinced of God's working through his obedience. Family, I dare to believe that that is the purpose of these uncertain days, to convince Christians, particularly us, of the one God and the Savior who is certain, certain. The things that Paul had learned from God, he in turn taught to the saints. Philippians 4 and verse 9. He said, so the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. That's a word of encouragement, isn't it? But it's, it's a, that's contentment, isn't it? To know that by practicing the things that we have learned, God is with us. That's contentment. How can we receive it? Again, by practicing the things that we have learned and heard and seen. It is time to put Paul's example into our practice. Praying all the more. Praising God at all times and all the more. And giving ourselves to serve others all the more. Despite being physically distant, we are blessed by having many ways to draw closer. You see, we can still fulfill the the intent, we can fulfill the, the purpose of Hebrews chapter 10. You'll know the passage well. It is the passage which instructs us to assemble one with another, not to forsake the assembly. But we can still fulfill the reasons for that assembly. Although this morning we cannot draw near with handshakes and hugs, it says there, we can draw near with sincere hearts and in full assurance of faith. Despite the social distance, we will hold fast to our confession of hope. 
and we will hold fast. Because as the Hebrew writer says, he who is promised is faithful. We simply need to reconsider how to stimulate one another to good deeds. We need to reconsider how to continue to encourage one another all the more. Thankfully, there are many good sources of sound teaching. I wrote in the email the other day, the many sources that you could see video sermons online. Several churches have good sound teaching. Several places, World Video Bible School, among others, polishing the pulpit. Certainly there's sound teaching available from the Christian Courier. So many sources sources. But can I suggest to you as well, some of the best teachers can be from your brothers and sisters in this congregation. And so whether by phone or text, draw near. Draw near with a sincere heart. I'd encourage you to draw near to the encouragers among us and become encouragers. Learn from those among us who have learned to be content. They're not terribly distressed by the time. They're content. They're not finding a, a great need to dwell on the problems of this day, but have the assurance in God's promises to rejoice even now. Though we are sheltered in place, we're, we don't have to be completely alone. Oh, we can order out, take out burgers or a pizza, and we can meet at opposite ends of a picnic table down in the park. You may not hold hands while praying, but as in Paul's days, the prayers of the righteous span a great distance. And certainly they connect us in one spirit and mind. Family, by whatever means, I would urge you to let others know how they have blessed you. Last week, I received a message from a sister I haven't seen in 12 years. And I had no reason to expect to hear from her. But she remembered my Wednesday night devotional all the way back from 2007. And she shared with me how that has continued to bless her. Nadina can tell you it was the day that I needed such a blessing. And it reminded me that I am called to be such a blessing. Family, it's not a time to hunker down. It's really not. Rather, it's a time to double down. It's not a time to go light on our efforts but to go all in, to reach out across the social distance and by the reach, assuring each other that God is indeed working all things for good. For God's good purpose, Romans chapter 8 is again a message written to keep the saved saved for eternity. That is God's purpose. If you would turn there, Romans chapter 8, We'll begin reading in verse 29. God, Paul is writing to those whom God has saved, reminding them of the assurance of their salvation, instructing them further in, in how to live as a way pleasing to God. He's reminding them of God's purpose. Romans chapter 8 there he has just said in verse 28 that we know God causes all things to work together for good. Verse 29, for whom does he do this? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn of many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. Paul asked three intriguing questions then. 
Certainly those saints there endured their own troubles and trials. They had sometimes reasons perhaps that would have caused them to doubt. Paul asked in verse 31, If God be for us, who is against us? The answer is no one. In verse 33, who will bring a charge against us? The answer is no one. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of God? No one. Family, this assurance is why Paul was always content. It's why he's convinced of his place in God's purpose. He is convinced, I'm sorry, he is content because he's convinced of God's covenant promises. He's fully convinced that in exchange for his obedience, in Romans 8, verse 38, then neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things past, nor things yet to come, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is no longer a secret. An old hymn reminds us, it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he will do for you. With arms wide open, he'll welcome you. It is no secret what God can do. Hopefully in these days, we are learning still to be content. I want to remind you that word for learn means to obtain by use and practice. So just as Paul said in Philippians 4 and verse 9, of the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. During these uncertain days, we not only have the time, we have been given abundant opportunities to practice these things. Family, I'm grateful for the encouragement you are to me. And I hope this lesson is an encouragement to you. I would urge you to reach out to others. Be a blessing. Be an encourager. Be a stimulator. I'd urge you to call those you don't typically call. Perhaps take a sweet treat to those whom you rarely associated with, even when we could. And in all those extra special efforts, it will make at last our family reunion sweeter still. Let us do even more to be a blessing to one another. And until then, may God bless you and strengthen you in the faith and in his peace until we meet again. Amen.